It was conceived in Cardiff in 1906. If, at the end of our term of office, it were found that the present Parliament had done nothing to cope seriously with the social condition of the people, if they do not provide an honourable sustenance for deserving old age, then a new cry will arise for a land with a new party, and many of us will join in that cry. The words of David Lloyd George, President of the Board of Trade in a newly elected Liberal government, telling a crowd his plans for an old age pension. Two years later, he was promoted to Chancellor of the Exchequer and he launched his old age pensions bill. We do not say that it deals with all the problem of unmerited destitution in this country. We do not even contend that it deals with the worst part of that problem. But what it did do for the first time was to give the state a role in providing a subsistence income for everyone who'd finished working. And 70 was very old after a life of manual labour. It recognised that the minority who made it to that age were entitled to a bit of a rest and the state would help pay for it. On New Year's Day 1909, more than half a million people aged 70 and more who had worked all their lives and passed a means test and were judged to be of good character queued up at their local post office for their first old age pension of five shillings a week, around £20 in today's money. But the pension paid today, more than a century later, is very different. As Lloyd George himself hinted, his pension was only a start. It took another visionary, a generation later, to recast the pension into pretty much its present form. The plan for Britain is based on the contributory principle of giving not free allowances for all from the state, but benefits as of right in virtue of contributions made by the insured persons themselves as well as by their employers by the state. The report by Sir William Beveridge proposed a system of what he called social insurance. Everyone paid in and that gave them the right to benefits if they were unemployed, too sick to work or indeed retired. He set up a national insurance fund so contributions were paid in and those same contributions paid out the benefits. That gave people rights, a sense of ownership, and protected them against future governments taking their benefits away. Or so they thought. But now there are those saying that £100 billion a year for the state pension is too much. We simply can't afford it. All would be well if we had a static-shaped population. But we have several independent things going against us at the same time. Michael Johnson, research fellow at the right of centre think tank, the Centre for Policy Studies. One of which is that pensioners are living longer. And secondly, our birth rate is low. So the relative size of the working population to the pensioner population is deteriorating. And therefore the pressure on the cash flow is becoming more and more assertive. So fewer and fewer people are paying more and more pensioners. Who are also living longer as and, pensioners. And you're suggesting that at some point that will no longer work? Inevitably, I believe it'll fall over. Since 1940 to 2010, i.e. 70-year period, the state pension age didn't move at all. But life expectancy over that 70-year period had increased by around 17 years. So we are faced with a fundamental problem that this is something we should have addressed a very long time ago and didn't. And therefore to address it now makes it much, much more challenging. More later from Michael Johnson and his plans to replace the state pension because today we're looking not at the past but at the future and whether the state pension has one at all. So where are we now? Today, nearly 13 million people, men over the age of 65, women currently over the age of 64, receive the state pension. A full one is around £160 a week, and one in seven pensioners, around two million souls, survive on nothing else. Would you like a cup of tea? Oh, yes, please. That would be lovely, Jean. Thank you. Oh. 
milk. Just milk. No milk. Okay. How long have you been living here? Twenty years. Really? Yes. It's a nice quiet place. It's nice here. When I first came here, I didn't think I would stay. Sixty-seven year old Jean Story lives by herself in her home in Pontefract. She receives £170 a week of state pension support. It's her only income. She started work at the age of 16 and retired at 63. She had a number of jobs during her long working life and finally worked controlling the lorries going in and out of a delivery depot for the supermarket Asda. You worked for a big company. Was there no pension attached to the job? Well, the thing is, I never bothered with a pension because when I was married... It's stupid, really, but my husband paid into a private pension and it was a really good one. He had his own business, my husband, and it was paying quite a lot of money into this pension and I thought we were going to be together. And we had quite a good carry-on when I was married and never worried about money or anything. And then when we divorced and I had to go out then and got a job because I had to support myself then and two teenagers... But I never earned a lot of money, so I didn't feel at that time that I could afford to pay into a pension because I needed all the money. At that time, I think I, I, I never brought home more than about £600 a month. And that's about the same as her state pension is now. But living on that amount in 2017 is tough. One of the things I miss, really, is I don't go out very much. I can't afford to go out a lot of the time. And whereas at one time I used to meet friends for, my, for lunch or we'd go to Wakefield for the day or Lee's for the day and have a coffee and a browse around the shops, I can't do that now. In fact, I think they stopped asking me because I was forever saying, well, I can't afford it. I can't go because I can't afford it. So. That, that's a shame. So did they, did they come and see you? Uh, sometimes, but when you haven't got money... It's, and I don't like to keep saying it all the time. Like, sometimes I'll say, well, you know, I'm not too good or uh, I'm not really bothered. Because, you know, you have a bit of pride, don't you? You don't want to keep saying all the time, well, I can't afford this and, and please feel sorry for me. I don't want that, but I am the poorest person I know. All my friends are better off than I am. During my chat with Jean, she agreed that the state pension made sure she was... OK. But is being OK what the government should provide after 47 years at work? No, not really. I think it should be a bit easier. You know, it should be... I shouldn't have to count every penny and... Well, every pound, and I shouldn't have to... I should be allowed some treats and not feel guilt... You know, not feel that I'm taking it from somebody that... No, I have, I have worked all my life and I have paid a full stamp all my life. And I feel a bit like something needs to be done. That stamp, what national insurance contributions were commonly called in the past, is the key to pensioners feeling they have paid for their pension. But even if they haven't, they're not left destitute. 73-year-old Margie Ford paid very few stamps as she was abroad for much of her life. Her low state pension is topped up by a means-tested benefit called pension credit, which brings every single pensioner's low income up to around £160 a week. I have a very small state pension. It's actually, I think, £43.50 a week, so it's topped up with pension credit. Apart from that, the only other income I get is the annual payments from the government. There's a, one, what they call warm front, which is help with electricity bills, and then the normal heating allowance that all pensioners get, £200. So those are just one-off yearly payments. But I totted it all up and then sort of divided it into monthly. The annual income is 8,286.20. It works out to 718.85 a month on an average. Yeah. And the rent here and things like council tax? That's, that's covered by housing, housing benefit, council tax benefit, yes. Margie is an active member of her local church and gives it what she calls a tithe, 10% of her modest income. She says she spends more on family and friends than she does on herself. I have enough, and if I didn't give all that away, I would probably be saving an awful lot. As it is, 
My bank balance is always pretty healthy, fairly healthy. What would you say to people who live on much the same income as you but tell us that, that they really struggle to do it and it, it's a great effort? Well, personally, I find it very surprising because I think pension credit particularly is very generous. So I was going to ask you what you think the government should do for pensioners, but from what you say, you're, you're perfectly content on what you've got. I think it's all wrong. You know, when all the young people are suffering so much, pensioners on the whole are, are probably better off. And I, I think, you know, winter fuel payments is fair enough, probably, for people on my sort of income, although I would manage without it if I had to. Two views on how easy it is to manage on the state pension and nothing else. In 2010, the pension had another makeover. Years of complex additions were removed and a single flat rate was introduced for all new retirees. It was fixed at pretty much what Jean and Margie live on, £160 a week or so. The man behind the new state pension was Sir Steve Webb, pensions minister from 2010 to 2015. Why did he pick that amount? Well, affordability is about level and it's about age. And we've set the level at about a third of the national average wage. So, you know, it's, it's a bare minimum. It couldn't be much lower without needing means-tested top-ups. The age is going to have to go up but needs to be fair and with good notice. Then it's taxable when you get it, so the government gets some back there. I think that, you know, if we can't do that, then it's difficult to know what we do do. We otherwise pay a very low pension, rely on means testing, which misses people, discourages small savers. I think this is the best balance, this is the one we've got. And to protect it against future inflation, he introduced the now famous triple lock. The pension would rise each year with the highest of prices or earnings, but if both were low, it would always rise by a minimum of 2.5%. But now, in a new role as policy director with the mutual insurer Royal London, he thinks that may be too expensive a commitment. When we produced the Royal London Manifesto for pensions earlier in the year, we said the triple lock had a part to play for the people who are already pensioners, many of whom are older, widows, many of them are poorer. Whereas for the newer pensioners, on average, they're about £100 a week better off than the over 75. So if at some point you were going to switch the triple lock off, the thing to do would be to apply it to existing pensioners who are often on the old, rather low basic pension, not apply it to the new ones who still get an earnings link, and gradually thereby you, you cap the cost and focus more more and more of the triple lock on older pensioners who need it most. The triple lock is an unusually generous way of keeping a pension up with inflation. So does that mean it's more generous than those paid by other developed countries? How much do they spend? Monica Kweiser is Head of Social Policy at the OECD, the Office for Economic Cooperation and Development. 34 countries are members. She has studied how to compare their pensions. The net replacement rate is a very important indicator for pensioners. It means what share of your last disposable income you can take home. So what we're looking at is the take-home pay that a worker or his family has in the pocket, and then you calculate how much the day this person retires still is left in his pocket. So 20%, for example, means that um, the pensioner will have one-fifth of what he had to buy all his basic needs and services when he retires. So what percentage of income is provided by the OECD's 34 members? The Netherlands, 91%. Spain, 82%. Austria, 78%. Luxembourg, 77%. Japan, 35%. Ireland, 35%. Chile, 31%. Mexico, 25%. United Kingdom, 22%. It's very striking from those tables that the United Kingdom comes bottom or nearly bottom in all of them. Why is it that our pension is so bad compared with the rest? Well, what we've done at the OECD is we generally look at mandatory pension schemes only. So um, we look at pension schemes that everybody in the country either has to have or uh, the largest majority of people have. And the reason why the UK system is so low is there's only the public pension that is mandatory. And after that, there is no company, occupational or personal pension that everybody has to have. And since the basic pension in the UK is very low compared to many other countries, it comes out lowest in those tables. 
We are introducing something called auto-enrolment, you probably know, which is a mandatory scheme, but it's not fully in place yet. And so that would be counted as part of the, the mandatory side when that's fully in place. Absolutely. We have looked at what would happen if the UK had the auto-enrolment scheme as a mandatory scheme, and then indeed the UK would move up to 22nd or 23rd position in OECD countries because the pension promise that everybody's supposed to have would then be much higher. Do you think the UK state pension as it presently exists is sustainable? Financially, it must be sustainable because it is not a very high pension. The problem is more, will it be socially sustainable? Because for us at the OECD, the only question is not, will it be financially sustainable? You can squeeze the system a lot, but if you have massive amounts of people falling into old age poverty, then then it is not a socially sustainable system. So we must strive to devise pension systems that also encourage working longer and enable people to have a comfortable retirement, not living in old age poverty. Our state pension costs about 5% of, of GDP, of, of national income. That's predicted to go up to just over 7%. How does that compare with other countries? Well, many other countries are already at 9 or 10 percent in the OECD, and some of them are projected to go to 12, 13, 14 percent of GDP. Now, 5 to 7 percent of GDP spending on, on public pension is very low in the international comparison. So there is certainly space to spend more on public pensions to avoid old age poverty. So Monica Kweiser thinks we can afford it, at least compared with what other countries spend. But Michael Johnson, who you recall wants to get rid of the state pension, questions her figures. Well, I don't agree because there's a lot of risk around, first of all, guesstimating what GDP is going to be in 50 years' time. And the recent past certainly suggests to us that, by and large, everybody has been overly optimistic. But if you look at other countries wealthy countries like our own in the European Union or in the OECD, they are already spending a lot more on their pensions than we are and predicted to spend a lot, lot more in it by 2050 or 60. So if they can afford it, why can't we? Well, they may discover in 5, 10, 15 or 20 years' time that they can't actually afford it. And there are indications appearing from around the developed world in particular that this is actually the case. One of the key elements of the beverage plan in the 1940s was that the new national insurance contributions would pay for the new benefits for unemployment, sickness and, of course, the state pension. The money was accounted for in a separate fund, the National Insurance Fund. And broadly, year on year, the amount going in equals the amount going out. But when it doesn't, the Treasury tops it up. In 2014-15, a Treasury grant was required of £4.6 to plug the gap. So what was going out was larger than what was coming in. The following year, 2015-16, that grant had risen to £9.6 billion. But the need to top up the fund isn't Michael Johnson's main problem with the state pension. He believes giving it at the same age to everyone is just unfair. Our population's life expectancy is actually diverging. So if I give you a very simple example, of uh, two 65-year-old men, one living in Chelsea and the other living in Tottenham uh, Green, which is a ward in North London, and the life expectancy of the 65-year-old Chelsea man is around about 88. For Tottenham Green man, it's around about 71. So Chelsea man will enjoy the state pension for about 22 years and Tottenham Green man will enjoy it for approximately five. And that seems to me extremely unjust. Hasn't it always been like that, though? Because there's always been a fixed pension age and some occupations, some parts of the United Kingdom, people live much shorter time. Well, it hasn't been the same to such an extent because life expectancy of the wealthier cohorts of society is accelerating relative to the poorer uh, members of the community. And so the injustice of the existing universal state pension age is becoming more stark. I think one of the key components is to uh, introduce what I would call a senior citizen's pension from probably the age of roughly 78 to 80, which would be considerably larger than today's state pension. Doesn't that raise the same problems, though, that you mentioned earlier, that 
wealthy people had get it for, what, eight or ten years, some people had never reached that age to claim it at all. But nothing to the same degree. The key question, if one adopts that sort of approach, is what happens in the interim period between sort of 65 and 80. Yeah, so you've got a pension at 80, come what may, you're a citizen, you get this pension of £200 a week or whatever. What about the transition to that by it for everybody else? I see a movement towards people adopting individual responsibility and funding their retirement income for that 15-year period with substantial contributions from the government. So like uh, one of the more recent versions of the ISA, where you pay money in and you get topped up by the state? It is not a coincidence that I have a considerable interest in the lifetime ISA and the offerings of the 25% bonus. Uh, it is an extension of the lifetime ISA type of thinking. And again, there are models elsewhere around the world. One example I think we ought to be looking at very closely indeed is Singapore where essentially individuals are compelled to save during their working lives and they are putting together uh, contributions of roughly 20% per annum into a savings pot that has their name on it. But so, that clearly is the amount that's needed. I mean, everybody agrees, I think, it's got to be 15 20 25% to have a reasonable standard of living just from that in, in retirement. But we're not starting from there, are we? We're not starting with a new country where we could say... Once you're 20, you've got to do this, and then fine, when you reach 70, you'll have a decent income. We're starting from a place where people haven't been doing that. That's right. In terms of the implementation of the sort of structure I'm thinking about, let's do it through example. If, if rights to the state pension came to an end in 2020, for example... So you'd scrap the state pension absolutely, from 2020? Absolutely, I would scrap it from 2020. But to be clear, to the extent that you have accumulated rights to it... Uh, they would be retained. Scrapping the state pension altogether and replacing it with a form of subsidised saving might seem an extreme measure. But as the cost of the state pension tops £100 billion a year, consent from the younger population who pay for it will become more and more essential, especially if they feel pensioners, and not the young, are getting a growing share of the national income. But Sir Steve Webb says his new state pension does not need changing. I'm not sure what problem we're really trying to solve. We know we're going to have a lot more older people. We know we're going to have to pay pensions later to make it affordable. But actually a system which is redistributive, you know, higher earners put more in through their life and get a flat pension. It helps women and others who tend to have poorer contribution records. It's actually dealing with a lot of the issues of the labour market, unequal earnings, caring and all of that. I think it's a good system. Actually mucking about with it, taking it off from minority groups, you know, those right at the top, I just can't see what we're trying to achieve. It makes it complicated and the beauty of the new system once it's up and running is it's a lot clearer. People know where they stand and they know what they've got to build on. In 50 years, will there be a state pension? Categorically, yes. Next week, our series moves to the workplace. Here's Adam Shaw. Thanks a lot, Paul. Yes, an age in which employers were expected to look after their staff for life with generous final salary pension schemes looks like it's coming to an end. Not only is there a lack of provision, there's a lack of trust. I don't really have faith in pensions as it is. I don't feel that you've got control and I don't feel that you've got choice because I can't think of another financial product where your employer would choose it for you. That's Laura, whose concerns she feels are echoed by a large part of her millennial generation. Well, in the next programme, we investigate the retreat of the final salary company pension, what it means for workers, what the alternatives are, and just what the future might hold. And you can hear that programme at the same time next week.